welcome to a online podcast or video cast or whatever we feel like we want to call this. If uh, you haven't seen in the last uh, two or three weeks, there's been a little bit of a back and forth between Zach Talander and these uh, people at GoDout, another kind of strength and conditioning company. So there was a podcast that Telly posted last week, this week, a couple weeks. Last week, yeah. And so it was just a conversation between uh, Zach Talander and Rick, Coach Ricky from Goda. And we just wanted to go through and kind of break it down, break down the arguments, because we see a lot of them it was like just them talking past each other. So we wanted to break down where the miscommunications were happening and try to provide that middle ground that was really lacking in that conversation. Yeah. Kind of the context of the podcast was originally Zach was calling out the people at Goda for kind of being gatekeepers of their knowledge and then kind of just providing bullshit functional training knowledge that seemed to be a little bit over the top and outside of the realm of science. And then the podcast was supposed to be them debating whether or not this is a valid form of training and each of them trying to explain their points on the, on the issue. And it started out relatively well, but as it went on, they kind of just got angry at each other and stopped effectively communicating points and basically just yelling whatever their version of facts were. So they were both making valid points, but their ability to communicate those points was getting lost a little bit more as the podcast went on. Uh, Tellender, I guess, kept his cool a little more. He was more effectively communicating his points, whereas Ricky from Goto was kind of just spouting off with lots of jargon and basically saying that he didn't need science to prove that his methodology was correct. Yeah, he just wasn't, he made good points, but he wasn't saying it in a way that you would convince somebody else if they had no idea what you were talking about. Yeah. Like if you were an insider into his industry and knew everything that he knew, you might be able to understand his points. Like we could understand his points because we understand what he's talking about even before he's making his points, right? Because this is knowledge that we already know. But for anyone that doesn't know exactly what his field is, it would be impossible for them to comprehend what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And knowing specifically his philosophy, if you don't know his philosophy, you're kind of out in the dust and he just seems like this crazy person who's saying crazy things, but yeah. yeah. So as we go through this, I'm going to kind of talk to some of Tellender's points about why weightlifting is a valid methodology for strength and conditioning. And then Parker here is going to go talk through some of the points that Ricky from Goto was trying to make as to why we're, what we're going to define as functional training is uh, a good methodology for strength and conditioning. Yeah. So I think we, we should have a good understanding. Like we should be able to see both sides from us. Cause I've been more functional training lately and Alex is still big into weightlifting, but we see each other's perspectives. So it should be a, should be a cool conversation. Let's see what it goes. Yeah. Okay, do you, uh, do you want to start then? With, uh, yeah. I, just have, I have one more point on the intro that I want to speak to. Okay. And then one last thing before we really get into this is that in the strength and conditioning industry and training in general, if you make any sort of statement, any blanket statement saying this methodology or this exercise is absolutely no good and is never good in any context, you're probably wrong. <laughs> every exercise, every methodology works within its own context. And as long as you're following a, like a certain thing for a certain reason, it's always going to be able to be justified. There's nothing that's absolutely wrong all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, and that was a lot of what the conversation was, is the go to people were saying this was bad. And then like weightlifting was bad. And then Kelly was like, oh, bad you're, you're, all the time because vague reasons. Yeah that yeah. nobody could possibly understand without, yeah. Anyway, um, so let's start with Alex. You wanna talk about kind of Telly's perspective and what he saw there. Yeah, so just to give the context of what Telly was trying to argue, uh, Ricky from Goda was saying that weightlifting and powerlifting movements don't have any place in the weight room for strength and conditioning because Ricky is saying that these weightlifting and powerlifting movements 
produce force off of the inside corner of the foot rather than the outside corner of the foot, which is objectively wrong all the time. That's Ricky's perspective. And then Tellender was trying to fire back with, well, the sport of weightlifting, the sport of powerlifting, those are inherently different than modifying those movements for strength and conditioning. So the comparison that Tellender gave was mastering the snatch for the purpose of the sport of weightlifting is extremely different and much more nuanced than having a basketball player grab onto an empty barbell and put his hands on it nice and wide, like in a snatch grip, and then just jump and catch it overhead. That's nowhere near the same as an Olympic weightlifting snatch. It's a completely modified movement. It's probably going to be used on someone who doesn't have an effective body type for the sport of weightlifting. And we're modifying it for the purpose of increasing uh, force production and rate of force production to be carried over to sport performance, right? So it's much more nuanced than, okay, we're just going to have this athlete from basketball learn how to be a weightlifter and then making them a weightlifter is going to be good for their sport, sports performance. That's not what Talender believes in, right? He believes in a more nuanced approach where you can modify these exercises for athletes of other sports. And he brings in the justification that it is scientifically proven with countless papers that back squats, deadlifts, snatches, cleans, all those sorts of movements are proven to increase rate of force production and a bunch of other athletic qualities, right? Right. But now where Ricky from Gota comes in is he says, okay, yeah, sure, that's scientifically proven to increase these attributes, but that's increasing these attributes off of the inside corner of the foot rather than the outside. But that's not an area that's looked at by any of these scientific studies. So whether or not that force is produced off the proper corner of the foot, absolutely those qualities are increased, right? So Talender is arguing that okay, we can use these modalities to increase general force production from an athlete. And if we need to teach them to move off of whatever corner of the foot, right, we can still do that. But it doesn't necessarily need to be inherent in every single movement they do all the time. Yeah. And I think there's a big difference here between the sport of weightlifting and using weightlifting movements. Yeah. Because the comparison the to that is that he says, okay, well, if I have a basketball player doing a snatch with a barbell, right, that's not weightlifting. That's like comparing a game of horse to a game of basketball, right? There's the same implement, but it's two completely different contexts. Yeah. yeah. Just because it's a barbell doesn't mean it's the sport of weightlifting. And so, yeah, if you have someone, which the GOTA coach, Ricky, he – took the video of one of the Polish lifters snatching 180 kilos in competition and saw his knees collapse a little bit and was like, that's bad. And obviously like this is somebody performing at the top of his level or top level of his sport and doing a movement to just straight up and stand up with this crazy amount of weight over his head. Yeah. And in the context of that weightlifter, he's doing snatches to snatch the most amount possible. Yeah. Right, he's not doing snatches to increase his vertical jump for a game of basketball. Two different contexts. So for him, it, it would be better to be good at having force be produced through the inside foot because it is so specific to his sport. Yeah. And it seemed like the other guys took that out of context and was like, this is bad because pain. Yeah. So before we continue here, one thing that Ricky never did in this podcast was actually define what is going on when we compare producing force off the inside corner of the foot versus the outside because that's something that we would understand right but if you went into this podcast with no context of what that means you'd be totally yeah. wrong. so can you just explain that a little bit yeah so basically if you look at the foot we're talk, talking about like the, the tripod assume my hands are the feet <laughs> but if you have like your heel you have the outside bones and then kind of like underneath your big toe which is not where it is in your hand but so you have this tripod and so they're saying when you're weightlifting, you're putting your weight kind of through the whole tripod because that's how it is. Because that's how you can put the most amount of like force and grip into the ground. Yeah, because that's how but, you can disperse the pressure. Yes, exactly. But when you are in an athletic setting, you want to be on the outside two metatarsals. And he said this once. He's like, oh, you want to be on four and five. And that's yeah. how you just put four and five. And it's like... Yeah, four and five. I, right? Yeah, I knew what it meant, but like... 
that so that you want to be on the four and five metatarsals because if you were to look at the skeleton of the foot and up into uh, like the naviculars up up in the like the ankle bone there is less movement there and less bones to go through less musculature to go through compared to that inside so you are using you're relying on less musculature and more bones so you are more connected and you don't have to push through as much force and also it's on the lateral side which will get that more lateral line and activate that glute and help create that kind of external rotation to activate your glute the strongest muscle in the body a little bit more and so that that's what he was trying to say throughout this whole time but when you when you are squatting you kind of need those other muscles and that that tripod foot for a little bit more stability and to use every muscle of your leg to try and push it through. And so it was just like com comparing tomatoes and tomato or uh, like apples and oranges is better. So but, like in brief, right. If we talk about inside corner of the foot, what we're really meaning is center of pressure. If this were a foot is going to be right here in the middle and you're going to be less reactive. You're not going to be able to change direction as easily. Whereas if we talk about outside corner of the foot, rather than center pressure being here, center pressure is going to be over here on those fourth and fifth metatarsals. And then you're going to be more reactive. You're going to be able to change direction a little bit easier, right? You're going to have a lot better lateral stability. You're going to be activating. Um, the less give in the foot so you can react quicker and you don't need to like coordinate a bunch of tiny muscles. It's, it's more, it's just more connected through the core in that manner. Yeah. So, and yeah, you just did not explain that whatsoever. And it was just, it was really poor and just, it just meant that when Zach got talking or asked a question, he didn't get an answer that was satisfying Yeah, because he was saying things, but without the actual explanation. So, yeah. yeah. So now that we've got a little bit of context as to what Ricky was talking about there, can we go into a little bit more detail about some of the points that Ricky made that may have got lost on calendar in the audience? Because yeah. I know Ricky He's definitely talking about how there's this concept of reverse movement technology, but again, has no definition for it. Yeah. So that was one thing that I saw right away, especially in that, that first video he made about, yeah, Telly's first video, he was talking about how this, this Ricky coach created these new terms and one of them being reverse movement technology. And I was okay because he, he made, now he was criticizing uh, Ricky for creating a new term and being like, Oh, there's already these terms in place. Why are you creating your own? It's very convoluted. And I was not pleased with that argument because if you are doing something new or you have this new information and if it, especially if it's like a bunch of kind of, so if, if you have a bunch of pieces of information that go together and you create one term to classify all of those pieces of information, so ultimately what reverse movement technology is, is that when you're walking backwards, your heel is going to come in and you're going to have this internal rotation at the, the, the femur to the basic principles of it. So that is kind of what's happening when you're weightlifting as you can see when people are extending that heel is coming in. And so he's calling it reverse movement technology because it's like you're walking backwards as opposed to when you're walking forwards. And so they want to see forward movement technology, which is this pattern of the heel moving out as you're walking or running forward because the gait and your walking patterns are like 99% of your movement. Yeah. Right? Humans are meant to walk and that's what differs us from every other animal or anything else. So that pattern is if you're using reverse movement technology, which meaning heels coming in there's internal rotation of the femurs and you are like using your back a little bit more compared to let's say your glutes or whatever your this pattern is reverse movement technology and instead of explaining that every single time he said that term he just says the term mm -hmm. so just because someone in a different area of strength and conditioning doesn't understand that term doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to make new terms yeah, but he does go out and say, yeah, if you Google reverse movement technology, it's not going to be a topic that a lot of people are talking about, which, all right, that's totally fine. You can make a new term to describe a phenomenon if that term doesn't exist, 
But if it's not widely recognized and widely known, you need to be able to be ready to explain that term whenever you're using it. Yeah. And so, after you've explained it, then you, that person understands, then you can just summarize it with that term. Yeah. So I was okay with him not explaining it in his Instagram video that he made because yeah. that video was for his followers, who people who have been following him and know what it means. And yeah, people who already have the context. Exactly. But they know the go to form the calendars podcast, right? Those people are going to have zero context. Yeah. And so he pretty much refused, not refused, but he like explained it really quickly, if at all, in the actual podcast, instead of like fully breaking it down and being like, okay, it's this heel movement with this femur movement, with this kind of locking in the spinal engine, which he also poorly explained. And then actually explaining it in a way to be like, do you understand what I mean? And yeah. to to really like break down why it is the way it is and why it's important. Instead, he just gave the term and said kind of what it was and expected people to just know what he knew. And that was not, that's not how you communicate your, your point. So. Yeah. And especially in the context of being a coach, right? You need to be able to communicate effectively to your athletes and just to the general populace, if that's how you're gonna market, you need to have that effective communication or else people aren't gonna understand what you're saying. They're not gonna get the cues that you're getting. They're not gonna be able to learn anything from what you're saying. Yeah. And that's kind of where Talender is getting this, this approach that, okay, people at Gota are gatekeepers of information, right? Because the people there aren't aptly explaining it. They're kind of just using their own terms and expecting other people to just get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, another thing with that is his explanation of spirals. So he was just pretty much saying, it's like, oh yeah, everything is spirals. Like all traditional trait weightlifting is in like these lines and these boxes, but movement is actually spirals. And that was about his old whole explanation. He's like, everything is spirals. You breathe in air through your nose and spirals, your blood vessels move in spirals. And it's like, what, what do you mean by spirals? Yeah. Like he just said that it's a word and that's what happens instead of explaining that when your foot is on the ground, the way you produce force is by having this rotational movement. So this means like you're using your glute to try and rotate your femur along your pelvis in order to extend it. Because whenever you are extending your leg or, or even flexing it, there is rotation that is also happening at the, at the hip. Yeah, and just to be, to just to be even more clear here, when we talk about that rotational movement that he's referring to in spirals, that's a rotational movement in the transverse plane. Yeah. Because when we talk about rotation in biomechanics, anytime a limb segment is moving around a joint, right? Even if my, my elbow is rotating here, that's a rotation. It's just in like the sagittal plane rather than the transverse plane. Yeah. Right? every movement in biomechanics is going to be defined as a rotation. So when Ricky from Gota just says, Oh, it's rotation. Well, like or technically all you didn't even say rotation. You said spirals. Yeah. Which is well, a, like another new term that even doesn't explain. as torque, right? And torque is any force acting on a rotation. So if all movement is rotation and he says torque, then he's just saying, well, spirals is all movement. Yeah. Which I mean, I guess technically isn't wrong, but does not offer an explanation that people really understand. No, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I listened to it and I was like that. I understand, but it's just say more, like explain yourself and yeah. let, let, assume that people have no idea what you're talking about and give them the explanation. And yeah. there was no attempt at that. And it, it seemed very difficult that for Tella, Telly and Max to, be like, what do you mean by that? Because they didn't, they didn't like want to understand because it seemed so crazy and out there. They were like, okay, can you break this down for me? Because he was saying so many things that yeah. were in the same boat. So it was like, can you break down this, 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 and this? And then maybe we can have this conversation. And it was just so hard to try and fight through that, I think. Yeah, because Max Ada there was trying to be the arbitrator between Tellender and Ricky. And anytime he'd try and interject and actually ask for an explanation, it's almost like Max didn't even know what he wanted an explanation for. Cause he's just like, there's so many weird things flying at me that I don't understand. Yeah. And it almost sounded like Ricky was just upset that they didn't understand without Ricky offering an actual proper explanation. Yeah. And so, yeah, he just kept going and kept spewing out information and 
more and more they just they were, it just created a bigger gap of them being like misunderstanding each other yeah yeah, yeah. that's where feelings got involved a lot more than knowledge and explanation yeah yeah and one of the big things too is that the uh ricky was talking a lot in absolutes he was pretty much saying like it's this way or the highway you know like this is yeah. the way you move without pain. Like we have the answer. If someone has back pain, you come see me. Like I know the answer. He was even like, tell you, you have knee pain. I know why, like I can fix it. You got to train like this. And it was just like, it was, it was very elitist, especially yeah. with their calling themselves like Goda, like the greatest of all time athletes, which is, it's something using the term goat is something you have, like you re- literally reserve for the greatest of all time yeah and it's like they're still a new company and they're not like they might know what they're doing and i don't doubt that but it's just it seems very elitist on top of not only calling themselves goda but having their movement system be called goda and then calling any other movement that isn't goda wota like the worst athletes of all time so if you like push from your your first and second metatarsal and the ball of your foot your woda and then the closer you go to the fourth and fifth you are goda and so mm. it's like the spectrum of elitism that they're trying to like get through and it's just it's very hard to accept and listen to people who feel that way and express it in this very cocky manner yeah and then as they kind of got more towards the end they were trying to get back to their topic of like what place does weightlifting and powerlifting have in strength and conditioning for these athletes of other sports, right? And Ricky was taking a super absolute approach there saying it has absolutely no place in it. Whereas Tellender was trying to take a moderate approach saying, well, yeah, all these other exercises that you list, they're a totally viable thing to do with athletes, but so is what I'm trying to produce, right? Yeah. He's trying to say that both things are viable. Whereas Ricky's saying, no, 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 weightlifting is bad. Only the go-to methodology is viable. Yeah, he was pretty much like weightlifting equals pain automatic, (laughs) which is like, I mean, a lot of weightlifters have back pain as you and I both know or whatever, right? But there's some people don't. And sometimes if you don't do it as often, like you won't get that same kind of pain or you can use it as a tool to make you better at doing all of the go-to exercises, I'm sure. Yeah. So how can we speak to, you know, weightlifting and powerlifting and, more traditional barbell style movements. How can we speak to that being applicable to other sports in strength and conditioning? Um, so I think we, we have to take it on kind of like an individual by individual basis, I think. And obviously I think we, it would be silly not to use barbell movements for most athletic people. I think. Yeah, I agree. Because if you're, it's one of the best ways to just gain overall strength. Yeah. And if you're not doing that, you could be kind of left behind. And especially in in certain sports where strength is such a, a needed quality in a sport. Like, so if you are taking like basketball, for example, like you do need some level of strength, like you might not be pushing them up to a 400 pound squat, but you want them to be able to, you know, push their body weight at least. Yeah. Just be able to take some contact and just have that brute strength in order to, help them in their sport when they actually have to take contact yeah so let's kind of break this down into what ricky was saying with producing force off the inside and outside edge of the foot so let's take two wrestlers for example they both weigh the same we'll say they weigh 150 pounds and then let's look at how we train them okay so if we train one to always produce force off the outside edge of the foot as most the most efficiently he possibly can right? Let's say he has a hundred percent efficiency of his force output, but if we're limiting him from not using any barbell exercises at all, he's probably going to have a lower absolute strength value. Yeah. Right. So even if he's a hundred percent efficient in producing all that force, let's say he puts out five units of force and that's his max output and he's a hundred percent efficient. So he's outputting that five units of force. And now let's say we have another wrestler only trains with barbells, he can only produce force off the inside edge of his foot, but his maximum force output is going to be 20 units of strength. Right. Just to be general. Right. But let's say he's only 50% efficient at expressing that force properly. 
he's still outputting 10 units of strength because his absolute value is so much higher. So if strength was the only thing that mattered in that sport, right, then even though he's less efficient at outputting that force, he's still going to output a higher net force. Yeah. But that's if we're speaking of training two different athletes only with absolutes on those methodologies, right? But if we combine those methodologies, we can find a happy medium where, no, they're not going to have a maximized absolute value of maybe 20 units of strength. And no, maybe they're not going to be 100% efficient. But if we get them at like 15 units of strength and we get them like 80% efficient, they're still going to output more than the other people, right? Yeah. Because we got to find a happy medium of that training where we can train them to produce as much force as possible while also being able to express it as efficiently as possible. Yeah, exactly. I think Goda's argument a lot with uh, being against barbell is the increase of injury. Yeah. But when you are an athlete, ultimately the goal is to win. Yeah. You can't just train to avoid injury. You also have to train to do well in your sport. And so having that extra strength is going to help bump you up and be better at your sport. Yeah. So yeah, whatever. But if you get better, and it's like you have to weigh that like the risk versus or risk versus reward, right? So if you're if you can increase your risk, but you might also increase that reward. So it it could be you know, well worth your time to do heavy squats to get that strength up. Yeah. And then the point that Tellinger made to that fact was if you play American football, you know, you're going to get injured at some point. Yeah, right? <laughs> It's inevitable, but then go to fire it back with, well, we're at least just trying to eliminate those non-contact injuries. Right. Yeah. But there's definitely a way that you can amalgamate those two methodologies to reduce the chance of non-contacts because you're never going to have a 0% chance of non-contact, right? There's always still going to be that chance there, but there's a way that we can amalgamate the two and put them together to try and still eliminate or not eliminate, but reduce that chance of non-contact while still maximizing performance and force output. Yeah. Cause if you can increase your speed or or like your strength, sorry, through these squats and then learn in other other movements, how to apply it through the outside of your foot. Yeah. Fine. So even if you do, whatever one strength exercise a day where you're, you know, loading that inside pattern. If you're doing a bunch of other stuff that's loading the outside, like you're still doing well. And if you are stronger, just muscularly in general, and now you start to be better at loading the outside, those squats are going to help you reduce injury just because you have that more muscular strength and hypertrophy and everything else. Yeah. Then another point that Ricky was making to that is that in these Eastern Bloc countries, right, where everything's socialist, many sport athletes are with their coach seven, seven days a week from the time they're like six or seven years old, right? So they have much more time through that long-term, develop, the long-term athlete development model to produce those patterns where they're always pushing off the outside of the foot, right? Whereas in North America, we don't always get that much time with our athletes to be able to instill those patterns. So he's saying that everyone in this country already has poor patterns no matter what. So we should devote 100% of our time to them in the weight room to these outside edge of the foot patterns, right? But as long as we're still being diligent with looking at our athletes one-on-one and where their strengths and weaknesses are, we don't have to just pick one methodology. We can always blend it based on a one-on-one approach with the athlete because some athletes might require more functional training and some athletes might require more barbell training to get them more strength, but it all just depends on a case by case basis. We can make an absolute statement about this whole group of athletes needs this because they live in this country. Yeah. That's a good way to look at it. I, I think that's one thing that Telly was trying to ask about and was kind of limited in his perspective because he was talking about, getting scientific research done from for these go to athletes because it's like oh well if your method works why not get it published so like you're recognized for it right and these go to guys were like why like i don't need recognition from academia because what we're doing is working for the athletes that we have and it's like he doesn't care ricky or goda doesn't care what kind of credibility they have in that regard because they are getting their own results yeah. And Ellie was like, but if you want to be seen as like recognizable and accredited, like you should do this, just get science in. It's not that complicated. But 
the process of getting scientific studies published and having it go through and dealing with all the all the bullshit ultimately is it's a super long process it's very complicated incredibly time consuming and if you already know that your stuff is working because you're doing it why would you waste your time going through that process and i remember when i was in school and we we're talking about therapies like this is for athletic therapy or healthcare therapy mm -hmm. it takes 17 years for a new modality to become like recognized and put in the in the mainstream yeah now if goda these if they claim if they have this new revolutionary thing if they were to do the scientific process they're wasting 17 years of time where they could have been making athletes better and yeah. waiting for that scientific study to come out yeah so and like academia is just a big dick swinging contest ultimately in this regard so it's like it does make sense as to why they don't want to do that and i understand where the the criticism is is like get it published get it like but they're just trying to help people right now yeah that's, and that's i think that's, totally, that's, all short. that's totally fine but the way they communicate it leaves a lot to be desired it was right cool. Sounds like Ricky just has a huge chip on his shoulder rather than, oh, I want to spend my time right now focusing on helping these people. He says, oh, why would I ever go to the ivory tower of academia and have these people give me their stamp of approval? I don't care about their opinion. Yeah. That's not how you should represent yourself, right? Especially if what you really want to do is just focus your time on helping people. You shouldn't just say, oh, I hate this group of people because they don't agree with me. Yeah. No, not a good way to represent yourself. Yeah, like I, I totally get it, but you have to explain the reason and how it it benefits you, and, and you actually want to help other people, and just that's just a waste of time, and I just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Instead of being like, no, fuck that, like that's it, I'm done. So. Yeah. yeah. And then, on the converse side of that, how can we talk about how some of this functional training or go to methodologies might be helpful to weightlifting and powerlifting instead of how those two methodologies can work together. Yeah. So I think like what I said before was using these strength exercises and then putting in like accessories as go to work or yeah. whatever you want to call it. I think that would be, and I think that's what we're really trying to do right now. Just how our, uh, our philosophy has changed and is progressing is like to make sure we get our athletes strong and then, to make sure they move well as well. Yeah. We don't want them to just be strength athletes unless they just are, but even if they are, it is good to get them moving in those, those new patterns that are more functional as much as I hate to use that word, but um, to the, the one point that go to makes is that walking is the primary pattern that we do. And so better we can make our gait and living our lives the better athletes we're going to be on the platform or on the mats or the court or whatever. Yeah. So the better we can make our gait, which is what we're doing, you know, 12, the 12 other hours of our day that we aren't in the gym or sleeping, then the better, 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 the better we are at that, the better we are going to be at our sport. So, yeah. And then even if we just add in some of those more functional exercises as accessories, if we use those to target specific areas, of the athlete, we can reduce, pain we can reduce incidents of injury or we can even rehab injuries right yeah and then if you look at the efficiency of a weightlifter right if their technique is a hundred percent perfect a hundred percent efficient they're going to continue on with that efficiency so long as nothing catastrophic happens right mm -hmm. but if we have a weightlifter with a low efficiency on his technique if that technique doesn't improve because of he doesn't have a good relationship with his coach where he's not being watched all the time. He's kind of just on his own or he's loading himself too much with poor technique, which is going to lead to like overuse injuries. That's over time going to give him worse and worse positions and worse and worse technique. Right? So if we kind of look at those two separate, if we have someone with good technique, that technique's almost always going to stay good. Whereas if we have someone with poor technique or poor positions over time, that's going to degrade and get worse. So if we have someone with that already poor technique and poor positions, we can give them a lot more accessories that are functional and that might improve their positions and their ability to improve their technique. Yeah. 
because just anecdotally, like you and I, we had Coach Rob who always said, oh, the, when I did less weightlifting, I found my mobility got worse. Whereas when you look at me, the more weightlifting I've done, the worse my mobility has got because yeah, I have much poorer positions than Rob did. So as I'm loading myself in those poor positions, my body is compensating by reducing my mobility so that I'm not hurting myself in those positions, right? So now if I add in some more functional training there as accessories, I can increase my ability to get into those positions, which is going to help me with my weightlifting. Which is exactly what, what we've done. We've been doing these weird accessory exercises that we've been sharing and it's been helping both of us. So, and some of it is based on Goda methodology. We, I'm getting it all from David Weck because he's less of a prick. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, to put it bluntly. He just explains himself better. Yeah. And it's just helped us both in like a short period of time. So I do think that there's a place for what Goda is doing. They just need to gain acceptance by communicating better. Yeah. And that's that podcast did not do that no. so yeah so hopefully that gave you guys a little bit of insight onto what was actually going on there if you didn't really understand the context and explanations that were somewhat poorly being given yeah let's run through a quick little how that podcast should have <laughs> went okay. all right hey guys i'm zach talender hey ricky from goda you know i believe that Movements from weightlifting can be used to increase certain variables of an athlete's athletic performance. If I use a modified snatch from weightlifting with, say, a basketball athlete, I might be able to improve their vertical jump. But I definitely don't think the entirety of their training should be weightlifting. What do you think? Um, yeah, so in my perspective, I see that would be an effective way to create those, those forces and that that vertical jump and potentially increase athleticism. But the way I see it and through my training and my experiences is that that will generally increase the chance of non-contact injuries. So there's nothing wrong with it. We just need to be aware of that. So the way that we have found to go about training is to put all our weight on the outside two metatarsals, number four and five, and pushing our weight through there because that is a more athletic position it's a little bit more connected through the lateral line. It activates what's called spirals. So when we are moving, everything is rotation. So we're pushing off our feet. We're creating that torque in the ground and it's activating our glutes a little bit more. So you can see that when we're moving, our femurs are going to be rotating in one direction or the other. And so this position will just help create or reduce the chance of injury, especially those non-contact injuries and just, make for a better athlete that that moves better and it'll apply more likely into their gait which they're doing for more period of time that sounds good ricky so it sounds to me like if we use barbell movements to increase the absolute force output an athlete can produce and then use some of your go to functional training to increase the efficiency of their movement patterns we can kind of put those two together and make what you would call the greatest athlete of all time yeah we could I, yeah. and I admit that our name is a little elitist, but it's just something that we chose and that's okay. Don't take it too seriously. Well, thank you for aptly explaining what your methodologies are and yeah. for listening to my opinions. Of course. Same to you. Awesome. Perfect. I'm really glad we Hopefully did this. this helps you guys and is not just a giant argument. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for having me. <laughs> totally welcome, Ricky. It's been such a polite conversation. Um, yeah, so that could have been how it goes. Yep, could have been a lot better. A lot yeah. better than how it was. So, yeah, the one thing to take out of this, I think, is that us and everyone else who wants to be a coach, you need to be clear in your communication and really understand that other people and other coaches, athletes, or other coaches, communities, don't understand your perspective. Yeah. So you need to explain it to them as if not if, if they're idiots, but as if they, they have no idea where you're coming from and why. Yeah. And this so, doesn't just apply to coaching or strength and conditioning, right? But it especially does because all of coaching is really trying to communicate information to someone to teach them, right? Coaching is really just teaching and 
guiding and mentoring, but it also applies to every institution of knowledge that there is in the world, right? This is why engineers and doctors still have to take English courses and communication courses, right? Because if you can have all of this information in your head, but you can't communicate it effectively and peacefully, then yeah. no one else is going to understand. And that's not going to be as effective as it could be. So yeah, it's going to limit your success if people hate you and just think you're crazy and don't understand what you're saying. So yeah. yeah. All right. I think that's it for today. You guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Hopefully this turns out okay. And uh, stay safe. Yep. Have fun with your quarantines. Yeah. Peace. Hey.